Hi dear medicos, myself Dr. Krishni Shri and our channel is back again. Today we are going to a new topic, a new symptom in neurology that is delirium. Delirium, uh, it is a uh, fine topic but we feel that it is some uh, hard topic like that. It is difficult to understand. Basically delirium is uh, understanding is something concerned with understanding and regarding delirium we feel most of the medicals feel that it is something difficult to understand yes it is something difficult to understand it is something difficult to diagnose first of all we will see the definition of delirium so what is delirium delirium first of all it is a syndrome we all should understand that delirium is a syndrome. What is mean by syndrome? Syndrome is a group of symptoms. So delirium as such is not a symptom. It is a syndrome which consists of so many symptoms and it is transient. So it is a syndrome. It is transient. What is the meaning of transient? It is a short duration. So it is a syndrome. It is transient. Next, it is reversible. That is, it can be bring back to normal. It is reversible and it is a cognitive dysfunction. So, we all know about cognition. What is cognition? Cognition is the higher mental function. Higher mental function. Higher mental function, that cognition, that includes memory, concentration, attention, language, record etc. So we all know about mini mental state examination also. So we will go to mini mental state uh, examination in some other classes. So regarding delirium, first of all it is a syndrome, it is transient, it is reversible and it is a cognitive dysfunction. So delirium is defined as a syndrome which is transient, reversible with cognitive dysfunction. So, I hope you understand what is delirium. Delirium is also known as acute confusional state. It is an acute confusional state. So many times we had gone through confusion in our lifetime. Is it not? Yes. So, there is a definition of confusion. So, please be don't get confused while hearing the definition of confusion. We will go to the definition of confusion. We will make it very very simple. So, confusion, it is a mental and behavioral state. Mental, it, it is pertaining to mind, behavior. Namada perimata, ala. So, mental and behavioral state. Apo, namada manasinum, namada behavior, namada perimata thinum, undaguna vera avasta. It is a mental and behavioral state. Ye avastata prateranda. What is the importance of this state? What happens? There will be reduced comprehension. We know comprehension is understanding. The ability to understand is comprehension. So, in this confusion, we will be having reduced comprehension and reduced coherence. What is coherence? Yes, it is the logical thinking and consistency. This logical and consistent thinking is known as coherence. So, there will be reduced comprehension reduced co coherence and also reduced uh, reason. Reasoning is logical thinking, reduced reasoning. So, this three includes confusion. Above, what is confusion? It is a mental and behavioral state where there is reduced comprehension, reduced coherence and also reduced reasoning. This is known as confusion. Above, we told that delirium is an acute confusional state. Now we are knowing about the definition of confusion as well as definition of delirium. So this delirium, it is very difficult to diagnose in the bedside or in patients. But once diagnosed or if it is not diagnosed also, delirium is a most important symptom of some serious disorder. It is a very important. It is a symptom of very serious disorder. So, this is regarding the definition of what? Delirium. Yes. Now, 
we will go to the risk factors of delirium. So, risk factors of delirium, it can be divided into two. One is predisposing factor and the other is the precipitating factor. Predisposing factor and the precipitating factor. What is the predisposing factor? Predisposing factor is a chance. Uh, it is the tendency or chance. That is either if somebody is having this predisposing factor, there is chance of getting delirium. It is a probability. It is a chance. It is known as predisposing factor. And what is precipitating factor? Precipitating factor is triggers. So, if that predisposing factor comes in combination with the precipitating factor, there is chance of delirium. You understand? So, risk factors of delirium include two. One is predisposing factor and other is the precipitating factor. Now, we will go to the predisposing factor. The first and foremost predisposing factor is old age. So, old age, if the patient is above 65 years of age, if the patient is above 65 years of age, he is more prone for delirium. So, all the persons above 65 years is not prone for delirium. So, first predisposing factor is old age. That is, if the person is above 65 years of age, he is prone for delirium. Second predisposing factor is if there is any defect in the basic cognitive function. So, in higher mental function, if the patient is having any basic defect, any small defect or some defect in the basic cognitive function, he may prone for delirium. You understand? So, there are two important predisposing factors. One is age, age above 65 years and second is the person having basic defect in the cognitive function. How we will be testing cognitive function? We will be looking for mini mental state examination. So, we will deal, it late, deal with it later. So, this is the predisposing factor of delirium. Second is the precipitating factor. So, if a patient is above 65 years and if he is having some defect in the basic cognitive function along with precipitating factors like 1. The most important thing is fever. If the patient is having fever. So, we have learned no fever with delirium, belladonna and all, fever with delirium. So, if the patient is having fever and if the patient is having the both predisposing factor, he may prone for delirium. So, one precipitating factor is fever. Second is alcohol withdrawal. Alcohol withdrawal. Alcohol delirium tremens, we know. So, alcohol withdrawal. Third is any infections. So, I mean, we will go to etiology later. So, I am talking about the precipitating factor. Any infections, any metabolic disorders, any endocrinological disorders, etc. The patient may go for delirium. Understood? These are the predisposing factors and precipitating factors of delirium. And these both come under the risk factors of delirium. Now, we will go to the causes of delirium. So, causes of delirium, mainly they are the precipitating factors and we will go with, uh, with the important, there are so many causes of delirium, we will go with the important causes of delirium. So, the first important cause of delirium is toxin. Toxin. Toxin Narnanda Vishap Anna, it is not, uh, um, it is means some chemicals which cause Effect in our body. It is not particularly toxins means visham, visham buddhi chai. It is not like that. So, it is some chemicals which is pertaining, which act as toxins in our body. So, it may be medicines. Some of the medicines. Or it may be alcohol. Or it may be some drugs. Psychotropic drugs. All this may produce delirium. So, first cause is toxins. Second is metabolic disturbances. So, what metabolic disturbances? Mostly all the metabolic disturbances like hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypokalemia or uh, what uh, this one, uh, fever, hmm? fever, hypo, uh, hypoxia, hypoxia, fever, then what, uh, then failures, all the organ failures will go for delirium, organ failures such as renal failure, pulmonary failure, cardiac failure, hepatic failure the failures. It may go for metabolic disturbances which in turn leads to delirium. So, first cause is toxin. Second is metabolic disorder. 
third is endocrine disorders endocrine disorders such as hyperthyroidism hypothyroidism hyperparathyroidism etc all these endocrine disorders will go for delirium may go for delirium if the predisposing factor is what along with that then next cause is infections infections such as pneumonia severe urinary tract infection then infections in the central nervous system such as meningitis encephalitis abscess etc then next cause is neoplasms neoplasms mostly it is due to cerebral metastasis if the neoplasm is having cerebral metastasis then there is chance of developing delirium then in case of seizures if the patient is having recurrent seizures he may prone for delirium so and the end stage delirium end stage delirium is end stage of life delirium very old people there is no particular cause and they are uh, they are in the death bed then they will be going for delirium so these are the more some of the important causes of we are talking about the important causes only that we are seeing in the clinical side so these are the important causes of delirium i hope you understand i repeat one is toxin second is metabolic disorders endocrine disorders infections neoplasms seizures life end of life stage delirium so these are the important causes of delirium then we will go for the pathophysiology of delirium i am not going to so much detail of this pathophysiology and all we will be saying the important things okay so the most important thing we should remember is it is a it is not pertaining to a particular part in the brain okay we cannot say see the defect is in the thalamus or we cannot see see the defect is in the parietal lobe we cannot see like that so we can see uh, some uh, defects in the whole of the brain or here and there in the brain so here and there means both in the cortical structures as well as the subcortical structures so the defect is both in cortical as well as subcortical structures so it is a combination of the defect combination of defect in the cortical and subcortical structures and it is not a defect in a particular part in the brain so cortical structures we all know now brain is having uh, cortex and subcortical area cortex consists of four lobes so many uh, motor areas so many uh, so many neurons and all so cortical areas and subcortical areas we all know again hypothalamus epithalamus subthalamus thalamus uh, what uh, what not huh? everything includes in the subcortical area so there is a defect in the cortical as well as subcortical area in the brain then some study shows that uh, there is defect in the acetylcholine when there is reduced acetylcholine which is a neurotransmitter so when there is reduced acetylcholine it may go for delirium so it may be a pathophysiology of delirium so it is not well understood the important thing is it is not well understood uh, then it is also known as the stress test for brain delirium is also known as stress test for brain because it is a reaction of the brain uh, to a what insult to a insult insult includes not mental insult it includes physical insult also such as infections or neoplasm whatever causes we saw it is all that causes insult to our body in turn causing insult to our brain so this delirium is known as the stress test for brain stress test for brain because it is caused due to an insult to the brain it is a reaction to the insult so this is the pathophysiology so uh, pathophysiology nothing more it is uh, there will be spast there is a combination of defect in cortical as well as subcortical areas and also second is acetylcholine if there is reduced acetylcholine there is chances of developing diarrhea and the third is it is also known as the stress test for brain so this is regarding the pathophysiology of delirium then we will go to the clinical features of delirium so at first itself we uh, discussed that uh, delirium is not a symptom it is a syndrome the first and the foremost important thing is there will be defect in cognition uh, this delirium is a defect in cognition so the first important symptom is defect ability 
so there will be acute uh, reduction in what ability of cognition acute reduction in ability of cognition and the very important thing is there will be defect in attention defect in attention shraddha allengil shraddha il is attention shraddha il undaguna defect aayikum koodalayittu delirium il undagunnathu so it is defect in attention all the other factors will be affected all the other cognitive functions will be affected but the hallmark of delirium don't forget this the hallmark of delirium is defect in attention and this defect in attention it will be associated with so many other symptoms it may be associated with uh, autonomic disturbances like defect in heart rate and blood pressure or it will, may be associated with defect in sleep wake cycles delirium this attention defect it will be associated with defect in sleep wake cycles and also it may be associated with hallucinations or delusions hallucinations or delusion all this will be affected along with this defect in attention so the hallmark of uh, delirium is defect in attention we should not forget this the hallmark is defect in attention i am again repeating defect in attention is the hallmark of uh, delirium okay then there are three types of delirium we'll go to the classification of delirium one is hyperactive delirium second is hypoactive delirium and third is mixed so one is hyperactive second is hypoactive and third is mixed type so what is hyperactive delirium so alcohol withdrawal is an example of classical example of hyperactive delirium what happens somebody is an addict of alcohol suddenly if the alcohol is withdrawn what happens he will be developing withdrawal symptoms so it is a hyperactive delirium so the patient will be hyperactive means there will be excitement more excitement or the patient will be more irritable or uh, the patient they, they will be very agitated they will be restless it is known as hyperactive delirium second is hypoactive delirium and the classical example which harrison says is opium intoxication opium intoxication is a classical example of hypoactive delirium the patient will be very much weak they feel sleepiness and they will not be active at all they want to sleep always and they will be very weak it is seen in hypoactive delirium and the differential diagnosis of this hypoactive delirium is depression most important is depression and second is dementia so this depression and dementia it should be differentiated from hyperactive delirium and third is the mixed type of delirium where both symptoms we can see so there are three types of delirium hyperactive delirium alcohol withdrawal is the example second is hyperactive delirium opium intoxication is the example and third is mixed type of delirium so regarding its delirium it will not be producing much effect after development so uh, it is less understood less understood what happens after delirium what the people do will after delirium what is the prognosis of delirium it is less understood but sometimes this delirium it may go for amnesia amnesia or the patient may develop some symptoms like post traumatic stress disorder ptsd post traumatic stress disorder because they will be having uh, memories frightening memories about this delirium or this confusional state so this is the prognosis of delirium so this delirium uh, it produces serious complications or what we don't know it is less understood but delirium is an effect of serious complication we have seen the causes of delirium and we understood that so in this class we have studied about what is delirium what are the risk factors of delirium what are the causes of delirium what are the pathophysiology of delirium and what are the clinical features of delirium so i think that we will stop the class today because um, i feel that you have get you become confused by hearing about confusion so please don't get confused if there is any confusion you can uh, ask your queries in my uh, in sorry message you can message me uh, your uh, queries definitely i will answer thank you stay safe happy learning thank you so much